All right, well, let's get started. So hi, everyone, and welcome to Global Forest Watch's Grants and Fellowships webinar. My name is Colton Naval, and I'm the project coordinator for our Grants and Fellowships. And I'm joined by GFW's user outreach specialist, Alice Gottesman. So today we'll be going over the application process for both the Small Grants Fund and Tech Fellowship before diving into a live demonstration of the Global Forest Watch platform. We'll have plenty of time at the end for questions, so please feel free to type any questions you have as we go through the presentation, and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. Uh, so before we dive into the Small Grants Fund and Tech Fellowship, we wanted to give a brief overview of Global Forest Watch. Global Forest Watch is an online platform and alert system that provides tools and data for monitoring forests. We use a variety of satellites to detect forest clearing annually for the entire planet at a 30 meter resolution, weekly monitoring for the pan tropics at a 30 meter resolution, and daily fire alerts at 375 meter resolution. Uh, our cutting edge technology allows anyone to access near real time information about where and how forests are changing around the world and is entirely free. We believe that transparency and accessibility to data are key for better forest monitoring. And while Global Forest Watch is housed at the World Resources Institute, one of the things we like to emphasize is that GFW is a global partnership of nearly 200 tech and data providers and users, including governments, journalists, researchers, civil society organizations, communities, and former small grants fund and tech fellows. So here's a little bit on our theory of change. We believe that by translating satellite imagery and combining it with local contextual data, government officials, civil society organizations, communities, and the private sector can use this information to enact policies for sustainable forest management, be held accountable to global commitments, improve supply chains, and empower forest defenders, ultimately leading to better outcomes for forests. And because forests face several threats from extractive industries to climate change, Global Forest Watch seeks to address this by gathering strong, accurate, and timely data, providing tools for analysis, and sharing it freely with all users. As I mentioned before, GFW is truly a global partnership. As you can see here, we have hundreds of partners and collaborators all working towards the common goal of reducing global deforestation. This is the partnership you will become a part of as a fellow or grantee. So now we'll give a brief overview of the Small Grants Fund. So the objective of the Small Grants Fund is that we seek to promote broad uptake and innovative use of GFW tools and data by civil society organizations around the world. Successful projects translate forest monitoring information into action, applying Global Forest Watch to overcome challenges in protecting the world's forests. In terms of the timeline and funding, uh, the application deadline for Small Grants Fund is March 15th, and projects will run from June 1st, 2019 through May 31st, 2020. We'll be awarding grants in the range from 10,000 to 40,000 US dollars, and aside from these financial benefits, we also have technical benefits, such as trainings and technical assistance that are provided throughout the project lifecycle. And as I mentioned before, grantees will become a part of a network of organizations and receive benefits that extend beyond the lifetime of their grant, including membership in the GFW partnership, opportunities to connect with like-minded groups through GFW events and online forums, participation in GFW trainings and webinars, and opportunities to test new GFW features and applications. Your work could also be highlighted in WRI's newsletters, blogs, and social media. So now onto the eligibility requirements for the Small Grants Fund. It's only open to organizations that are legally constituted as nonprofit and non-governmental. Your organization must also have a total annual budget greater than 30,000 US dollars. You must have a computerized financial system for tracking and recording expenses. You can still apply if the system is Microsoft Excel, but an internet-based program can reduce the amount of reporting your organization is required to do if awarded the grant. 
You must also be able to complete an organizational assessment and reporting documents in fluent English. Uh, and just a quick note for selected grantees, we will go into more detail about the organizational assessment and reporting requirements in a future webinar. From a project standpoint, accepted applications will have an explicit focus on using Global Forest Watch's near real-time data, specifically our weekly GLAD alerts and or our VEERS active fire alerts to enhance local responses to forest threats. Finally, projects must focus on pan-tropical countries with tree canopy density greater than 30% and vegetation higher than five meters, along with good GLAD or VEERS active fire alert coverage. For a complete list of eligible countries, please check our guidelines that will be linked on another slide. So again, just a reminder to apply by March 15th. In terms of the application, applicants must complete the full application on our online application system. As a part of this, you must also upload a budget using our Excel template, which is available on the application system. Just another reminder about the deadline. Um, Qualifying applications will go through a three-stage review process, including an initial review, an internal review, and a committee review before final selection. And as noted here, around 10 projects will be selected, depending on the budgets proposed. So now moving on to the Tech Fellowship. <clears throat> the objective of the Tech Fellowship is to scale the impact of Global Forest Watch by equipping the most innovative and dedicated forest protection advocates around the world with the skills and cutting edge technologies to halt deforestation. We're, we're looking here for tech innovators, journalists, conservationists, campaigners, law enforcement officers, lawyers, scientists, analysts, cartographers, and indigenous leaders who are committed to expanding their forest monitoring experience and then sharing this knowledge with others in their networks. A little bit on the timeline and funding. The applications for the Tech Fellowship will be accepted on a rolling basis and projects will run in parallel with the Small Grants Fund from June 1st through May 31st, 2020. Applicants will receive a $1,000 uh, US dollar monthly stipend and access to additional funds to support direct costs. These direct costs could, be, could include in-country travel, trainings, equipment, or conference fees. In addition to some of these financial benefits, there's also ongoing mentorship and training opportunities with GFW staff and partners. There's also the 2019 Tech Camp and GFW uh, U Summit. So this will include your round trip airfare to Washington DC to attend both the Tech Camp and the Summit, your visa costs, transportation and accommodations for the entire duration, um, which is about a week. <clears throat> and again, fellows will also become a part of GFW's global partnership and receive WRI coverage in our newsletters, blogs and social media. In terms of the eligibility requirements for the Tech Fellowship, it's open to individuals across a wide range of backgrounds who are driven to apply technology to solve forest problems. This part's really important. Fellows are required to attend the GFW Summit and Tech Camp, which will both take place in the same week. Selected fellows should plan on arriving in DC no later than June 16th and departing no earlier than the evening of June 21st. If you know you cannot make these dates, please do not apply. Again, attendance is mandatory for these. Like the Small Grants Fund, tech fellowship projects must focus on countries where we have good data and GLAD or VEERS active fire alert coverage. For a complete list of eligible countries, please read our guidelines on our webpage. Please also note that fellows do not need to be from the country or area where they will be carrying out their fellowship activities but will be expected to live in or travel regularly to their area of interest. Fellows will also be expected to demonstrate pre-existing contacts and relationships with stakeholders in their area of interest. So the process for applying for the Tech Fellowship is fairly straightforward. Um, please visit our webpage for uh, the link to the application along with our guidelines. In addition to completing the full application, fellows are also expected to submit a work plan or detailed project proposal 
detailing how they intend to carry out their activities throughout the project life cycle. One thing to note is that fellows will have the opportunity to revise and workshop their plans with the support of GFW staff during the tech camp. And again, applications will be accepted on a rolling basis until we've selected five fellows, so apply as soon as possible. So all the information I've covered in this presentation can be found on our webpage, specifically within our FAQ and guidelines. This PowerPoint will also be made available to all of you and includes a link to the various resources you will need to review as you complete your applications. As you can see here under the Apply tab, there are resources here for both the Small Grants Fund and the Tech Fellowship. Here's the FAQ for the Small Grants Fund. Here's a link to our guidelines. It's very important to read through this carefully before you apply and to keep referencing it as you're applying. Here's a link to a webinar highlighting some of the past Small Grants Fund project recipients, and this will give you an idea of the types of projects we are looking for. And here's a link to our application. It'll take you directly to our online application system. For the Tech Fellowship, it's very similar. Here's a link to the Tech Fellowship FAQ and a link to our guidelines, which again are very important to read through as you're applying. And then finally, a link to the application. You can also check out the projects tab to learn more about the past grantees and fellows, the types of projects they worked on and their geographic focus. That's right here. This nice little globe that you can click on and explore all the different types of projects that fellows and grantees have worked on and some more information about the different projects. And then finally, this about tab right here just gives kind of a high level overview of the Small Grants Fund and the Tech Fellowship. So this wraps it up for the Small Grants Fund and Tech Fellowship portion. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Alice who will give a run through of GFW platform. All right, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'll now take you over to the Global Forest Watch platform. So Global Forest Watch was la launched in 2014 as a fully interactive online platform with forest monitoring data for the whole world. GFW's open data policy ensures completely free access to its hundreds of data sets and code so that anyone can build on the information to produce new research and spin-off applications. While GFW offers a variety of tools, today we'll review the main GFW platform and the Forest Watcher mobile app, since these are the tools that are most relevant and useful for monitoring, the focus of the Small Grants Fund and Tech Fellowship call for applications. So I'll now run you through the GFW platform. So first, you can navigate to www.globalforestwatch.org. And from the home page, you can easily access the map, dashboards, log, and about page from the top bar. We'll delve into the map and dashboards in just a moment. So as you scroll through the home page, you can start to explore more about our data, some of our use cases, our applications, and our announcements. You can also subscribe to our newsletters to stay updated on Global Forest Watch. And at the bottom of the page, you can access the blog as well as the how-to portal if you're looking for tutorials on how to use our applications. You can also find our social media pages here. So now if we go back to the home page, it will lead us to the map which I already have open here. So as you can see, our data covers the entirety of the globe. And one interesting feature to note is that as you move the mouse around the map, the URL in the browser changes. This allows you to easily share the exact map view that you're currently on. So the three data sets that are automatically applied when you vi visit the map are tree cover gain, tree cover loss, and tree cover. You can identify which color is associated with each data set on the panel on the left-hand side, 
as well as what years the data covers. So now if you look at the map, you can see where each color is and understand what that color indicates. So for instance, if we zoom in on Brazil, we can see where tree cover loss occurred based on where the pink is on the map. You can also toggle with the time frame for the tree cover loss data and watch it change over time by pressing the play button. So I'll move this over to 2012 and we can watch it accumulate between 2012 and 2017. So to learn more about the data sets, you can click on the eye icon right on the upper right of the data set. And it'll bring you through the function of it, its resolution, geographic coverage, where we got the data from, the frequency of updates, and more information. These, char these characters also let you toggle with the opacity of the data, data or remove it from the map. Some other functions on the map include the ability to show only the map, to share or embed your map view, or to take a tour of the various features of the map in case you get lost in a certain function. So on the left-hand side of the map, we categorize our, our data sets into five different topics forest change, land cover, land use, climate, and biodiversity. By pressing into each topic, you can view the data sets we offer and see which are most relevant to you. Please note that we offer some country-specific data sets. For instance, for Brazil, we offer data sets such as Brazil biomes and Brazil land cover. There are also explore and search tabs. When clicked into the Explore tab, we can see forest topics, places to watch, and stories. Forest topics let you explore data related to the drivers and impacts of forest change, including biodiversity, climate, commodities, and water. You can easily view these on the map by clicking this button. Places to watch, on the other hand, are updated quarterly and let you explore areas of recent forest loss that are potentially of the greatest concern to the world's remaining forests. You can sign up to stay updated on places to watch from here, as well as view it on the map and read more about each chosen location. Finally, Stories display stories submitted by our users as well as by our media partners such as Manga Bay. You can also view those on the map or click to read more. So under forest change, you can find our alert data sets such as GLAD alerts. GLAD alerts identify areas of likely tree cover loss in near real time and are provided to us by the global land and Analysis and Discovery, or GLAD Lab, at the University of Maryland. So if we turn on the alert, the GLAD alert data set, we can see the areas across the map of recent likely tree cover loss. We can also compare where they are located with our other data sets, such as, for instance, our protected areas data set. From here, we can take initial steps to investigate the alerts by activating recent satellite imagery. So I'll zoom in a bit and find an area over in a protected area where there are some GLAD alerts. From here, I'll press recent satellite imagery. This tool shows the latest satellite imagery that meets the selected cloud cover criteria from the Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 systems. We can also toggle with the maximum cloud cover percentage, change the view, as well as the acquisition date. We can zoom in further to get a better view. We can also change the base map, for instance, to the satellite view, to gain a clearer visualization of the area. So I'll exit out of these two data sets so we can have a clearer view. 
Within the base map function, we can also select base maps with contextual information like the names of cities, rivers, and other features. So now for the analysis function on the map, you can first select the map's boundaries. And from there, there are two ways to conduct analyses on the map. The first is drawing or uploading a shapefile. To draw the shapefile, you can easily place dots and connect them on the map. Once your shape is fully connected, the analysis will occur. To upload a shapefile, you can select a file from your computer. The shape will appear on the map and the analysis will be performed. So the other method for analysis is clicking on a layer on the map. To analyze the data on a particular region of Brazil, we can click onto that area of the map and the analysis will automatically occur. Once your analysis is complete, you'll have the options to subscribe to the data in the region your analysis was performed and to or to explore it further on a dashboard. So as you can see, the dashboard offers the ability to view clear visualizations of the data in particular countries, regions, and subregions. You can easily manage the data in each widget by clicking into the settings tab. You can also embed the data from particular widgets or the entire report or download the data to your computer. Great, so I'll now move back to our presentation and uh, talk a little bit about the Forest Watcher mobile app. So Forest Watcher is a mobile application and web-based platform designed to allow easy offline access to data about forest change from Global Forest Watch. It enables anyone with a mobile device to download deforestation and fire alerts, navigate to the location of the alert offline, and collect information about what they find. In addition to the mobile app, Forest Watcher also has an online interface called Forest Watcher Web that allows users to customize data and forms, retrieve reports, and manage teams of, manage teams of users. Forest Watcher is used by community forest monitors, park rangers, conservation organizations, protected area managers, journalists, and environmental police to detect areas of forest disturbance inform their patrol routes, and collect digital information about their observations. So when applying to either the Small Grants Fund or Tech Fellowship, you'll want to consider how you can use Global Forest Watch in your project. Some examples of use include forest management, monitoring, and law enforcement, advocacy and campaigning, journalism and storytelling, data collection or generation, scientific or policy research, and education and training or capacity building. So while we're here, we wanted to also tell you about another opportunity separate from the Small Grants Fund and Tech Fellowship, our first ever user story contest. The GFW user story contest seeks stories that detail the human dimensions of its work. Our goal is to empower people everywhere to better protect forests, so we want to hear from you about how GFW tools are being put into effect. Top stories selected will be awarded prizes, including a free trip to the GFW Summit in Washington, DC on June 18th through 19th, GFW blog and social media features of the work, and sorted GFW swag. The contest is open to users from all sectors, be they nonprofit organizations, community action groups, or government departments who are currently using GFW. I just really want to emphasize this, that this is meant for people who are already engaged in using the platforms.
Applications are due by March 15th and winners will be announced on April 15th. To learn more about the contest, follow this link to our blog announcement and submit your story from this link to enter. All right, thank you everyone for your time. We appreciate you all joining us for the GFW Grants and Fellowship webinar. We'll now open it up to questions, so please feel free to type them into the Q&A section. All right, everyone, so we have a lot of questions coming in. I just wanted to briefly introduce Jessica Webb, who's the Civil Society Engagement Manager and who's managing these two uh, programs. Um, so she is here also to help answer some questions as well. Yeah, hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining the webinar. Um, so yes, your questions are coming in and we're gonna do our best to answer them live. So for the first one that I saw, it was where in the, where in the tech fellowship application is the project proposal? It's built into the application. So there's a section in the application that will basically say work plan instructions and that's where you'll um, fill in your detailed proposal work plan. Um, for the question about why Papua New Guinea is not eligible, it is an eligible country. Um, so apologies if that wasn't clear in the, in the countries list, but it, it is eligible. Yeah, we'll double check to make sure it's included, but it should be in the, in the list um, that's available on both of the applications. You, so there's a question, can I download the GLAD data? Yes, yes you can. And the easiest way to do that I believe it's through the MyGFW. Yes, yeah, so you can you can download the Glad Alerts data in two different ways. If you're interested in just downloading the data for a specific area of interest, um, then the easiest way to do that is through the Global Forest Watch uh, platform, um, which uh, Alex Alice explained how to um, define your area of interest either through drawing an area, uploading a shape file, or clicking on a, a polygon on the map. Uh, so through that, there's an option to download the data. Um, if you want to download all of the GLAD data, you're also able to do that. You can do that through our open data portal. Um, it's a lot of data. So um, unless you're interested at, in looking at the alerts like at a global scale, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but if you, it is a possibility. Um, you can also download that data, the entire data set directly through the University of Maryland's um, GLAD lab website. For the question on what is swag, um, <laughs> swag is just uh, like products, like fun products that uh, I'll, I'll, Alice can, I'll let Alice handle. It. So it's swag. just GFW branded material. So that could include notebooks or recyclable shopping bags or pens and stickers, various items such as those. Yeah, it's a slang word in English. <laughs> so apologies for it. <laughs> The confusion there. Another question, can I apply to the fellowship while my organization applies to the grant? Yes, that would be fine. Does the Forest Watcher app work offline without internet connection? Yes, that is um, why it was developed. It was as a tool to be able to use offline so that whenever you did come back online to have internet access, you could upload that data to have it shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, as Colton said, that that's the that was a main purpose of developing the app because, um, of course, people who are interested in, in forest monitoring when you go in the forest, um, or even in in uh, as we know, you know, cities that are uh, located next to forests, there isn't always great internet connection. So we developed the Forest Watcher mobile app so that users can download um, either GLAD alerts or fire alerts for their areas of interest and then go offline into the field to do missions, investigations, um, uh, as to the drivers of those alerts, and then collect information about what they're observing. So take photographs, um, write down observations, take videos. Um, and so that, that's the, the main purpose of the Forest Watcher mobile app. So it's, it's very useful uh, for forest monitoring. Um. So there's a question about the capacity building line. Is it possible to present a proposal for virtual and face-to-face -face training activities and can it be regional? Yes, 
I'd say the answer is yes. Although we do want to emphasize that we do expect you to be actively living in or traveling regularly to your areas of interest with these projects. And for organizations, we want them, it's similar with the fellowship as well, right? With yeah, I mean, I think that's actually a great idea. Um, obviously, like in, in what we're doing now, right, is a, a virtual training session, and it's, um, I think it's a great way to reach a bunch of different people. Um, however, we found out in, in, you know, in our past experience, really the most successful capacity building activities are those that are ongoing. So it's useful to do a demo, like a demonstration of the tools and platforms like this in a virtual way, but really to do um, more of an in-depth training, it's very helpful to be able to do that in person. Um, so certainly we would encourage um, doing a combination of virtual and in-person capacity building. Okay, there's a question about um, how does the GFW tools data coverage and the WRI Restoration Opportunities Atlas relate? Um, as far as I know, the Restoration Atlas ignores arable and cropped areas. Please elaborate. I am located in Northeast India. Um, yeah, so the Restoration um, Opportunities Atlas is a, another tool um, developed by WRI um, that does just that. It shows where uh, there are um, likely areas or suitable areas for um, restoration, for forest uh, and land, uh, landscape restoration. Um, so there's sort of different tools for different purposes. So there may be some geographic overlap, um, but really the audience is, is, is different because the objectives are different. Um, Global Forest Watch, on the other hand, is um, intended for forest monitoring and conservation. Um, we are working with the University of Maryland to um, be able to improve the tree cover gain layer that's currently on the map um, to make it annual. So there will be a little bit um, more of a crossover for Global Forest Watch users who want to be able to see um, tree cover gain, um, possibly for monitoring of restoration, um, as well as um, deforestation. Um, but again, they're, they're different purposes. So if um, uh, users are really interested in, in restoration, it uh, would be better to use the um, Restoration Opportunities Atlas. The next question is, is it enough to only use Global Forest Watch blog news to apply to the small grants program. Um, I am, I'm not sure I understand that question. If the person who, who wrote that wouldn't mind clarifying, um, just typing, typing your answer into the, the chat and explaining a little further, because I'm not sure I understand the question, and then we'll, we'll get back to you. Um, do you have downloadable GLAD data from year 2007? Um, so the GLAD alerts, which were the weekly deforestation alerts, are only available um, for since 2015. Um, so the alerts are not available for 2007. However, the GLAD annual tree cover loss, so that's the data that shows deforestation um, and on an annual basis so every year, um, that is available for 2007 and you can download that. Um, how much are you granted uh, depending on the budget and your application. Could you apply for 40,000 and be granted 30,000? Yeah, so 40,000 is the, the cap. There are many applicants who um, don't need the full 40,000 um, because they have an existing project. Um, they already have funding for, for certain things. So we really look at the range, you know, the range of budgets is between 10,000 and 40,000. Um, so there are many groups that um, ask for a range uh, between that. Um, it, there may be some cases where um, a group may ask for a, a certain amount of funding and we may review that and then go back to them before doing the final selection. Um, so for example, um, it's, it's okay to buy equipment um, you know, for, that will directly support the objectives of your project. So you know, if you're going to be um, working with community forest monitors and you need to acquire, um, and you want to use forest, the Forest Watcher mobile app and you need to acquire some mobile devices, some uh, smartphones or tablets, um, that's okay for your project. Um, but you know, if you are proposing to buy like a, like a vehicle, like a truck or a car, 
Um, that's not something that the small grants fund um, would support because that would take up most of your budget. So there may be some cases where we would go back um, and discuss with you your, your budget and adjust it in that way. So for the next question, can I still apply for the tech fellowship if I work for the government with a mandate to manage and protect forest or fellowship is only for NGOs? Yes, you still can apply and we would strongly encourage you to. Um, the small grants fund is only uh, available to nonprofit, non-governmental organizations, but the fellowship is open to uh, any individuals who are passionate about using technology to turn forest information into action. So yes, we would encourage you to apply even if you uh, work for the government, that would be even better. The next question is, the last time I was using Glad Alerts, it only covered up to district level, unlike Veer's Fire Alerts that covers up to village level. Has the Glad Alert coverage expanded? Um, I'm the, um, I, yeah, that's actually, I'm not, I'm not sure what, what you were looking at, but the Glad Alerts have always been um, a 30 meter by 30 meter resolution. So not necessarily available only at the district level. Um, for all of the areas that they're available, they're available in um, everywhere. So in these, in um, you know, 30 meter by 30 meter uh, resolution means, you know, these, um, uh, you know, areas of that size, which is, you know, roughly the size of um, two um, soccer or football fields, depending on what you call it and where you are in the world. Um, so, yes, it, it's not uh, contingent on um, jurisdiction. It's available, available everywhere. Um, can I access the data by other user, e.g., QGIS, or other website? You can access the data through, I mean, I guess the, the easiest thing to do would, would be, um, you, may, you may be able to find it in the directories of certain GIS programs, but probably the easiest thing to do would just be to go to the Global Forest Watch Open Data Portal or University of Maryland's Glad Lab and download the data um, and then visualize it um, in the in the software. Um, I know it's available through the like ArcGIS online lab um, directory if you search for Global Forest Watch. You can also find all of the, the data sets there. Um, but with QGIS and other like open source GIS, um, I'm not I'm not sure if the data is there and if it's the most accurate and updated data. So it would be better to go directly to the to the source to make sure that you have the most updated data. Mm -hmm. um, the question, I don't know if it's a problem with my internet access, but it seems that there is no country data for Cameroon. Um, so there, there is data for every country um, because of the global data sets that we have. So the annual tree cover loss, the tree cover gain, uh, tree cover, um, the, the, um, the GLAD alerts, which are available uh, pantropically. So um, um, those would be available in, in, in Cameroon as well. So a lot of the, the forest change data is available. Um, other data sets, it depends on what we have available for the country. Um, those contextual data sets um, that you all saw in, in the demonstration of the platform. So those could be um, mining or timber concessions or protected area shapes. Um, some of those are global layers and some of those uh, are just contingent on what data that we have um, that we've been able to, to acquire. Um, in Cameroon though, we should have pretty good data. In Cameroon, um, we have a forest atlas and um, if you email us at gfwfund at wri.org, um, we're happy to share the link to the Forest Atlas, but there are a few countries um, in Central Africa um, and in um, the Caucasus uh, and, if, and a couple other places where we have, we're sort of like Global Forest Watch platforms, but they're co-managed with the governments of those countries. And um, so we, we share the responsibility of um, uploading data to those platforms. So we have lots of great data for, for Cameroon because uh, we have a uh, team there that's been working there for a very long time. 
Um, so happy to, to share that information with you. So we have another question. Is it possible for local communities to use the Forest Watcher app to monitor their own little forests which are not protected forests? Yes, yes. And in fact, this is another, one of the main reasons why Forest Watcher was launched was to be able to expand the efforts of local communities to you to, to be able to monitor their forests. So yes, definitely. Yes, you can use it to manage any, any forest and really um, any group of trees. Um, so, you know, it's, it's different, different people define forests in different ways, but the way that the satellites identify uh, tree cover is um, with it, you know, a default of 30% um, canopy density. So, in if, you know, talking about the, the GLAD data, if this 30 meter by 30 meter area um, is at least 30% full of trees, um, then that will show up uh, in the algorithm and the interpretation of the satellite imagery. Uh, and then also the vegetation has to be over uh, five meters tall. Um, so that's what's defined as a tree. So the next question is, do you also recommend any specialized computer financial, computerized financial system for the application or can we just use any system available? So to clarify, um, the application system is the one that is available through the links on the website and you have to use that software to apply. Within the application um, software, there are instructions for how to submit your budget. Um, so you would need to use the required templates in order to submit your budget. The requirement in, for eligibility of having computerized financial systems is so that um, are, are, it's something that's required by our institute in order to have a sub, uh, an agreement with your organization um, that your, your systems are, are computerized. So um, you can't only have a paper system, you have to be able to track your finances within um, a computerized system so that when you generate uh, financial reports to comply with the terms of your agreement, um, they will meet the standards and criteria for our donors and also for our auditors. But um, it doesn't matter which computerized financial system you use. You just, you just need to, to manage your finances on a computer, computerized system. Okay, so for the next question, it says our NGO is small with an annual budget of 30 million. We would like to know if we can qualify for the grant since you're going to do some qualifications. To clarify, is that annual budget 30 million USD? Because the, the minimum requirement for the small grants fund application is that you have a greater, uh, greater annual budget of uh, more than 30,000 US dollars. So if that's 30 million US dollars, then you do qualify for the grant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As Colton mentioned, 30,000. 30, so I'm just um, if this is 30 million or 30,000, but either way, 30,000 is the cutoff. And the reason for that is because the, of the size of the, the small grant. Basically, we want, we want the small grant to support work that your organization's already doing because it's intended to be um, you know, a relatively modest amount of money for a relatively short amount of time, only one year. Um, so the, the objective of this is, is so that the, um, you know, there's some, it, it, it indicates some sort of sustainability of the organization. So your sole funding is not coming from this small grant. Yeah, is the active fire data the same as NASA or does it have the ability to capture small fires that happens in SIDs? Um, yes, our fire data uh, is the same as NASA. It comes from NASA. Um, so uh, you're right in that it doesn't, um, the resolution is fairly coarse. Uh, it's 375 meters. So it doesn't, it isn't necessarily great at capturing um, small fires. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, sometimes the, the challenges with some of these global data sets. Um, if you're not aware, we do have a Global Forest Watch Fires platform. Um, so if you just Google Global Forest Watch Fires or feel free to email us and we'll send you the link. Um, it does have um, some additional data, particularly for Southeast Asia, um, on um, has historical um, modus uh, fire alerts as well as the beers um, daily alerts and it also has a bunch of other uh, information on um, 
like wind direction and air quality and, and things like that. So if you're interested in fires, I encourage you to go um, to that website and, um, and see what data is available. So for the next question, when I subscribe to Glad Alerts in a region, where do I receive notifications? Email. Yes, that is correct. You'll receive the notifications in the email address that you use to create your MyGFW account or whatever email address you use to subscribe. And I believe if you're using the Forest Watcher mobile app to, to, to receive Glad Alerts, that you, you get notifications through that app as well, right? Is that? Mm -hmm. When you, um, yeah, for Forest Watcher, you create, when you create your areas of interest, you can um, go back into the app and refresh um, the alerts to, to see if there are any new alerts in the area. But yes, when you subscribe through the platform, you receive the notifications through your email. Um, what are the main, uh, what's the main criteria for the budget? Um, so for the budget, you know, we're looking for um, a, you know, activities and, and light items um, that basically directly support your proposal. Um, so the, you know, outcomes and um, results that you're proposing and the activities that you're proposing, we want to see in the budget that uh, it's, it's logical and makes sense and, and you know, supporting um, what it is that you say you're trying to do. Um, it is helpful to have some some uh, description in the budget. Um, so instead of just saying, uh, you know, travel, like what? Why are you? What is it covering? Like why are you traveling? How many people are traveling, um, et cetera? Or um, if it's for salaries, like who who is being paid and for how many days, right? So we want to be able to, to also understand like where the like what's the logic of your of your budget. Um, but other than that, it's it's fairly flexible as long as it's supporting what you're proposing. For the next question, for small grants fund applicants, when the cost for attending the summit is incorporated into the budget, must it still be within the maximum 40,000? The answer is yes. Uh, for applicants who are interested in attending the summit, we expect you to budget for the summit within that $40,000 maximum budget range. Yeah. And that's just because we don't we don't have um, additional funding to to be able to to bring everyone to DC. Um, but we think it's a really, really important um, and great opportunity. Um, this is the first time we're ever doing a summit of this size, and it's a really fantastic way to get to know other people um, and network with um, people working in the larger community of practice of, of forest uh, monitoring. So we saw the, the timing of the small grants fund um, as a way for um, potential grantees to you know, be able to build into their budget so that they can, they can afford to come when they wouldn't have um, otherwise. So, so we you know, strongly encourage um, applicants to be able to come to the meeting. We're also gonna have a special side event um, for past uh, um, uh, small grants fund recipients and, and fellows who are able to attend. Um, so, so yes, so we, we would highly encourage you to, to build it in, but um, no, we don't have additional funding outside of the 40,000 in order to cover travel. For the next question, can I apply to the fellowship without having a strong experience in forest monitoring? Yes, yes you can. Um, as I mentioned in the webinar, we encourage a wide range of applicants across a variety of backgrounds. What we're really looking for is a passion to use uh, to technology in some way to turn forest monitoring data into action. So folks who don't have a very strong experience in forest monitoring or technical expertise, say for example, if you have more of a legal background or you're more of an, in an advocacy background, um, part of this fellowship is to be able to get, to, 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 to train you in using um, Global Forest Watch technologies to improve your forest monitoring capabilities and then for you to share that knowledge with your networks. So even if you don't have um, a strong uh, background in force monitoring, um, we would still encourage you to apply for the fellowship because this would be a great opportunity for you to kind of gain those skill sets and, and share, you know, maybe some other non-technical skills with the other fellows. Yeah, we would want to see though that your, your um, interests clearly support forest monitoring. So maybe you've been working in doing some kind of 
you know, other environmental monitoring or working on human rights and you want to move more into, you know, forest monitoring, um, you know, you're a journalist and you've been covering, covering like other environmental stories. Um, so there should be, um, I mean, we are looking for people who, um, though as Colton said, don't necessarily have very strong technical backgrounds, like they don't have to be GIS or remote sensing experts um, or, or others that have a very strong technical skills per se, but the focus of your work and the, um, you know, your objectives for, for being a fellow um, and um, taking, you know, the, the application of forest monitoring technology um, to the next level should, should be logical and, and you, know, you should be clear about how this is going to, to help to further your your career and, and your objectives. Um, and so be, you know, be fo very focused on forest monitoring. Okay, the next question is, uh, here in Mexico, where my organization is based, we are required to get some data about our sponsors, like an ID of the le legal figure address, et cetera. Can we get those data if we get the grant? Um, so I, I think what this question is asking is, would you be able to get this information about the World Resources Institute? Um, and if that is the question, um, then yes, because all of that information will be in the uh, agreement um, that ultimately you will sign um, with the World Resources Institute and in order to um, carry out activities under the small grants fund or fellowship. So all the information will be, you know, it's a, it's like a legal, a legal contract, which we all have an opportunity to, to review and then I'll have all of that information. Um, if I didn't understand your question correctly, then um, uh, if you wouldn't mind, please, um, please clarify in the, in the chat window, but hopefully they answered your question. Uh, for the next question, do you provide training to our beneficiaries of the proposal on how to use GFW platform and mobile app? We're happy to, um, it, not, not necessarily. I mean, that's sort of your, your role since they're um, uh, your partners and, you know, people in your network that, that you know. However, um, if you would like, we're happy to arrange something like this. Like we could do a webinar uh, for your uh, partner beneficiaries um, if you'd like. Sometimes if we have um, travel, uh, one of our staff is traveling to the area where you are and you know, you'd like to coordinate um, doing like an in-person training, um, that's something that we could also potentially talk about. Um, but generally the idea is for you all as you know the tech fellows or as a small grants fund recipients to become expert users in global forest watch so that you in turn almost like a like a train the trainers approach so um, that you in turn can um, feel completely confident in in training um, your partner beneficiaries and that's because you know we we are a global organization you know we sit here in our office in washington dc and sometimes we get the chance to to um to, to travel and and you know do some trainings and demonstrations or go to conferences but you all really understand the context um, of your partners and um and the issues that are you know facing um you know forests in your area and how best to address them and so you are best place really to be able to understand how global forest watch works and then translate that um, identify the you know particular opportunities where they can really add value to your work um, and you know then be able to train on it in ways that um, translate to the the context in which you're working um, thanks for the answer and capacity building a follow-up question should we include your time in the proposal for training on the tools um, no it's not it's not necessary to include our time um, that's that's built in. That's part. That's a benefit of the the project. Um, and um, you know, in addition to the the financial support, I mean, we're we're here for you to help you out and make your project successful. Um, and so, um, for the uh, organizations that are selected for small grants fund or for the tech fellows, um, you'll have regular um, you know 
access and, and communication to Global Force Watch staff to make sure that all of your questions are, are answered um, or to do trainings or provide you with training materials or whatever support it is that you need. Okay, oh, the, it's a, this is a requisite of our tax agency. I assume that was for the um, earlier question about being able to get legal information uh, about the Institute. And yes, that's, that's no problem. Okay, besides the deforestation, is it also available for GLAD to see the land degradation um, as an impact of deforestation? Um, degradation is, that's a good question. Um, degradation is, um, is complicated because of the um, kind of te technical uh, inputs to the algorithm, which I explained before. So how the, how the alerts uh, detect deforestation um, and because of that, um, you know, that canopy density threshold, um, it, it can be difficult to see degradation. So just, you know, a few trees, like either selective logging or a few trees that are cut at a particular time. Um, the alerts are also um, designed to be conservative. Um, so that would mean that, um, sometimes they don't intentionally pick up all deforestation that may or may not be deforestation. And that's because of the, um, the cost of going out and doing the like, field investigations. We don't want a lot of false positives because we don't pe want people running out, spending all of the money and time and resources it takes to do field investigations when there's probably not uh, an alert there. Like there's not actual deforestation that has occurred. Um, so for that reason, the alert systems are, are fairly conservative. Um, but on the flip side, that does mean that degradation um, doesn't always show up within the alerts. Um, there are some techniques um, which we could talk about further for detecting where degradation is likely to occur. Um, for example, if with the alerts, um, you detect that it looks like there's you know, a, a line of alerts, that's something that might be like a road, right? Like we know if a road is appearing, then it's likely that degradation and then deforestation will follow um, just because um, that then provides you know, access um, into the forest and makes um, uh, timber extraction uh, more feasible. So if you were to see you know, a road happening, um, then you maybe would want to pay extra attention to that area um, to see um, if, if you know degradation will, will start to occur. Um, same thing with um, you know expanding agriculture, right? Like you might expect that if you see a trend in the historical deforestation data that um, an agriculture area is expanding, um, then you might expect that there would be a greater degradation in that area. Um, so it, it can help and that it gives you some clues but it doesn't necessarily detect uh, degradation on its own. Um, we are working for that towards that, and that's something that um, if you're able to come to the user summit, uh, you'll hear a lot about, because um, there are a lot of uh, really interesting and innovative um, people, like you know, people and techniques that are working on trying to do a better job of um, identifying degradation from, from satellite imagery, because of course it's, it's something very important, it's just a bit trickier. Okay, next question is, I'm interested in calibration, validation of canopy cover and above ground biomass equations data using UMB's upcoming, uh, sorry, upcoming Getty data. Since there are no value, validation done in India, can I combine Getty data with locations in GLAD alert areas? Getty is ISS based LIDAR data. Um, if you can, you can send us an email. Um, I, I think, I think um, we need to ask some follow-up questions, understand exactly what it is that you are trying to do, um, and then put you in touch with the person who's best place to, to answer that. Um, so if you can just write us at uh, gfwfund.wri.org, um, we will uh, respond to your questions there and, and or put you in touch with the person who's best place to do that. Uh, for the next question, can the tech fellowship be added to an existing project? Yes, 
Yes, definitely, definitely. Um, in fact, we've, uh, this will be the second year that we're doing the fellowship. And then last year we had some fellows who um, were fellows it, while working on uh, similar projects or as an addition to their uh, normal work. So for example, we had, a, um, we had a fellow from Cameroon who was working on GIS and Red Plus. And so her fellowship um, took place as a part of her ongoing work in Cameroon um, under that Red Plus project. Okay, the next question is, is it possible to request the purchase of a drone? Um, yes, if, that, if that's equipment that is uh, directly supporting um, the objectives and activities of your project, then um, yes, that would, be, that would be fine. We wouldn't want you to buy 40,000, you know, propose to buy $40,000 worth of drones and nothing else, um, but certainly I think, you know, having a, a drone as part of your um, project would, would be fine. Um, in the budget, is there a standard overhead fee for GFW applications? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, there isn't a standard overhead rate. Um, again, we would, you know, looking be looking at budgets that had um, reasonable overhead rates, right? That weren't the the majority of the the cost of the budget. Um, but we don't put limitations on on overhead. Uh, next question um, asks about. Uh, having an organization that has an annual budget less than 30,000 um, if they're eligible and no unfortunately not for the reasons um, that we explained before um, that's a, an institutional um, requirement and um, we uh, don't have any flexibility on that unfortunately uh, for the next question is the grant meant to be used on capacitation or to get GFW tools or to acquire equipment like to acquire equipment for forest firefighters? Yes, yeah, yes and no. It, so as a part of your kind of capacity building and the grant in terms of using GFW tools to acquire equipment, yes, um, the grant can be used to support uh, acquiring equipment. And, and the explicit focus of the grant and the fellowship is to use GFW tools, um, but the, the whole of your budget should not just be focused on acquiring equipment. Yeah, equipment, it, that is not, yeah, the, the purpose of the, the uh, programs is not um, based on equipment. Equipment, if included in your budgets at all, should be a very small percentage of that. Uh, the next question is, what is GFW's data on concessions based on areas stated in permits or actual areas worked on by companies holding permits? monitoring activities in the area? Um, yeah, that's a very good question uh, as well. The, the concession data that we have are based on, um, with, with only a few exceptions, it's official data that comes from um, governments uh, in, in the majority of, of cases. We have a few concessions data sets that come from uh, NGOs and we have some information um, that has come from from companies um, about um, like information, for example, on our, our global like palm oil mill list. Um, but most of the information comes from official sources. And uh, really the, um, you know, a lot of the activities that users of Global Forest Watch uh, are involved in are monitoring a company activity using the contextual data from that official con concessions data to show where deforestation might be happening, you know, outside the boundaries of official um, concession areas. So actual, um, you know, company activity and not adhering to the official boundaries um, or even within concessions where it might not be permitted or, or allowed. So the concession data, um, even the official data is, um, you know, intended to show what the legal, um, you know, permitting is, or like the legal, the terms of the concessions agreements between the government and the companies. Uh, and then Global Forest Watch enables users to be able to, to monitor that. Um, we do have a feature on the map called the user stories layer, um, which Alex, Alice mentioned in the demo. Um, so uh, users have uh, used the user stories layer to be able to um, pinpoint examples of where a company isn't complying with the official permit, right? Like they're 
activities may, may be uh, outside the boundaries of that concession area. So that is a uh, useful way to be able to share that information. We, we can include the purchase of mobile phones and GPS in the budget. Um, yes, that's fine if it directly supports the um, objectives and activities in your, in your proposals we mentioned before. Um, but again, it shouldn't be the majority of your budget. It should just be one part, one part of the budget. Will communities in Ghana, West Africa be able to use the Forest Watcher app to monitor tree cover on their cocoa farms? Um, yes, uh, the Forest Watcher app is available for anyone, anywhere who's interested in, in monitoring um, something. I mean, I, I would recommend the app is free if you have a, access to a smartphone or tablet. I recommend that you download the application and then create an area of interest uh, for the cocoa farms that you're interested in, in monitoring and you know take a look at the data there. Um, you may also want to go first um, to the Global Forest Watch platform and look at the LAD alert data um, that's available on the platform to get an idea of what you will be able to see on the application. Um, but yes, in short, it, it, it should be um, useful for, for those purposes. Is GLAD currently being used by governments of private projects as part of a monitoring program for a Red Plus initiative, governments or private projects? Um, yes, we know of uh, several different cases where um, GLAD alerts are being used for um, yeah, monitoring of compliance with Red Plus projects. Um, in some cases, uh, but also in addition to like governments or, or private projects, you know, as part of this, it, it could go either way. So we're, you know, governments obviously are, are um, using the, uh, the alerts to um, be able to, to detect um, like co compliance uh, with the terms of the Red Plus project um, in order to be able to, and other payments for ecosystem services projects in order to be able to, to issue um, payments, um, but it's also as a way for, you know, um, communities or um, yeah, other actors that have Red Plus projects to be able to prove that they are complying with the, with the project, like use it as evidence. So yes, that's certainly um, a, a use case that we know of. So for the next question, if we are awarded the grant for a 12-month project cycle, when can we expect to receive technical training from GFW? For the tech fellows, this will definitely happen during the tech camp, but it's, and for both the Small Grants Fund and the tech fellowship, um, we view this as kind of like an ongoing iterative process. There will be more formal trainings, um, I would say near the beginning of the grant, but throughout the project life cycle, if any sort of questions or issues come up, uh, we're, we're all here to, to provide support and help and can connect you with um, the appropriate uh, GFW staff may be able to help some of the more um, in-depth uh, technical questions you may have. Um, could you please tell me if I understood correctly that the traveling expenses to go to DC for the software capacitation is not included in the grant? Thank you. Um, so there, depending on the program you're interested in, um, there are two different answers to that question. For the tech fellowship, uh, it is, there is funding available to bring uh, the fellows to Washington DC for a tech camp that will take place um, immediately before and the days immediately before and after the Global Forest Watch Summit. And so that is outside of the monthly stipend um, that fellows will receive um, because that's a really important part of the, the fellowship. And so we do have funding allocated for that and we would work with the five fellows who are selected to um, you know, schedule their travel and, and make sure their expenses are covered. For the small grants funds, um, again, it's, it's not required, but we would strongly encourage you to build in travel costs into your small grants fund budget, um, into the, you know, maximum $40,000 you can ask for as part of the small grants fund to be able to uh, attend the summit. Um, we, we do not have funding allocated to bring small grants funds recipients outside of that budget. But again, it's such a fantastic opportunity. Um, we'd strongly encourage you to, to allocate some funding um, as part of your budget to be able to attend the summit. Okay. 
Does GFW send experts to train people in other countries? Um, not, not necessarily uh, in terms of uh, sending experts, um, but we do have some staff in different countries. Um, so they may be able to act as a resource for you. Um, so if you let us know um, by sending us an email which country you're interested in, we can let you know um, if we have staff there. Also, um, as I mentioned, if we have other, other travel scheduled, we may be able to set up a, a meeting with you and you know, do a training um, in, in collaboration um, with you. But um, yeah, not, not necessarily. Like, unfortunately, we don't, we don't have funds or um, enough staff to be able to meet all of the demands um, that we have for, for training. And again, that's one of the main objectives of both the Small Grants Funded Fellowship is really to be you know, creating expertise um, within different countries, um, since you all are the ones that understand how to, how to apply the, the different tools and, and data um, to the, the things that you're working on. Okay, um, my organization is only recently formed, does not have financial statement just yet, because we're only in operation for less than a year. We're currently managing a budget greater than 30K. Are we still eligible to apply? What other documents will we need to sub sub substitute the financial statement? Um, if your organization uh, has been in operation for less than a year, then I would say um, it's, it's unlikely that you will be able to pass the organizational assessment that World Resources Institute requires of all, um, of all grantees. So um, just because of the, the amount of information that's required that's based on past, past performance. Um, so I would recommend in this case that you just hold off and apply next year uh, once you have that information available. All right, and then we have a few questions in the Q&A, but unfortunately we are also running out of time. So we need, uh, we'll just try and get through these really quickly. Um, for the first question, how much accurate are the protected areas layers? Um, so there are two types of protected areas layers on Global Forest Watch. One is the um, WPDA data set, which is global. It's compiled from a bunch of different sources. Um, so it's global in nature, but you know may or may not um, have been updated recently. We also have some countries where we have uh, country-specific protected areas, data layers that come directly from the governments of those countries. Um, those may be a bit more um, accurate. Um, they may be a bit more recent. So it just depends a little bit on the, um, yeah, on the country and the, and the data set. So we, we try, again, to provide always official data. Um, there are also, you know, circumstances where, of course, practice is different than what's on paper. Um, but that's where we believe by putting the information in an open and transparent format on the platform that we can help uh, to you know, spark dialogue and be able to identify areas where data should be updated or improved or is no longer, no longer accurate. Uh, so there is a question in the application for the Tech Fellowship, there is a list of skills. What skills do you uh, found to be important to be selected? That's a good distinction. Um, so, in, when you're applying for the tech fellowship in that list of skills, the, the question is about what skills do you want to learn or gain? Um, so that's important to note. And a lot of the kinds of things we find are general trainings in uh, GFW, um, the GFW tools and platform, along with sort of participatory mapping, stakeholder mapping, uh, project management, uh, other, other skills have been like technical training, like in remote sensing and, G, and GIS skills. Yeah, yeah, so a lot of the skills that people have um, been wanting to learn or gain have kind of uh, been split kind of evenly between like technical skills and then more like project management. Um, and as I mentioned before, kind of like stakeholder mapping skills as well. Yeah, as, if, as long as the skills are, are relevant to the you know, objectives of the fellowship, um, it's, it's more important that the narrative of your application 
is clear and concise and you know directly explains why incorporating force monitoring technology is important to your work and then what what you propose to do all right everyone thank you again for joining us we'll be sending the recording um, in the coming weeks and if you have any more questions or we weren't able to get to your question please reach out to gfwfund at wri.org and someone from our team will get back to you have a great day or evening depending on your time zone